Hello everyone, this is Ty Green. As the world watches this atrocity unfold in Israel, we hear very little of the narrative behind what is said to have provoked this event. The event known as the Al-Aqsa Storm, this feud has a past and a future. I want you to be informed of this aspect of what's going on. I'm gonna share a few clips and article headlines along with the biblical connection to this that points to biblical prophecy. Israel says it's at war after Palestinian militants launched a major terror attack. At the centre of this conflict is Israel's military occupation of one Palestinian territory, the West Bank, and its blockade of the other, the Gaza Strip. To understand what's happening, it helps to go back to World War I, when Britain took control of the region. The land at the time had an Arab majority and a Jewish minority. An Arab rebellion and ongoing Jewish migration was followed by the Holocaust targeting Jews in World War II and a big increase in Jewish migration. In 1947, the United Nations, with Australia being a key driver, agreed that what had been known as the British Mandate for Palestine would be divided into a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jewish side accepted this, hence the State of Israel was formed. But the Arab side rejected it, sparking a one-year war as Britain withdrew. But as the years went on, Israel took more land than had been agreed by the UN. Palestinians call this the Nakba, or catastrophe, as hundreds of thousands of Palestinians fled. At the end of the war, Israel controlled all the land in blue, except for Gaza here, which Egypt controlled, the West Bank, which was controlled by Jordan, and the Golan Heights, controlled by Syria. In 1967, in what's known as the Six-Day War, Israel seizes the West Bank, the Gaza Strip and the Golan Heights. Israel then went on to occupy thousands of kilometres of Palestinian territory, which the UN says is illegal. This is what we now refer to as the Occupied Territories. Despite objections from the international community, Israeli civilians choose to live in the areas for political and religious reasons or for cheap homes. Here's where a lot of conflict happens, as Palestinians are displaced. We are protesting and demonstrating against In 2005, Israel withdrew from the Gaza Strip, a small coastal territory home to 2.3 million people, one of the most densely populated places in the world. Israel controls the airspace and the sea, and it controls the crossings used to ship most of the goods in and out. The crossing into Egypt is mainly used by people. Conditions for Gazans under the blockade are tough, with an unemployment rate of 50%, as well as deteriorating health systems and infrastructure. The group Hamas was formed in the late 1980s as frustrations grew. Hamas's goal is dedicated to Israel's destruction, and it's been designated a terrorist group by many countries, including Australia. Hamas, which has a militant wing and a political arm, won democratic elections in 2006, but wouldn't renounce violence against Israel and was isolated by the international community. It seized control of Gaza a year later. And while Israel withdrew from Gaza, it continues to occupy the West Bank. This means the Israeli army is the ultimate authority in the West Bank. The 3 million Palestinians there and the 2.3 million in Gaza do not want an Israeli occupation or a blockade. Another point of contention is Jerusalem. It's home to holy sites from three major religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Clashes in the region often escalate around major religious holidays, like the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur or Ramadan. This is a region that's faced tension for years, but these attacks show things could escalate even further. See, there's a reason why we're not hearing much of this term, the Al-Aqsa storm, or the Operation Al-Aqsa flood, or deluge. I believe it's because it will draw attention to the al Aska Mosque and turn this whole thing into a religious issue. In fact, you're going to see that in part, it is a religious issue. You're going to also see that it becomes a human rights issue for some, and it involves 
the Palestinians in what's referred to as an occupation. Surely I don't condone this attack. Israel certainly has the right to defend itself. Yet the world needs to know that this is a stepping stone and this is headed somewhere. What's really behind the Al-Aqsa storm? As we watch biblical prophecy unfold, we do expect wars and rumors of wars. As the Lord Jesus Christ shares within scripture, and these events do not exclude Israel. There are events that'll lead into future wars involving Israel. Some cite the Psalm 83 war. Today I want to share what I've uncovered in this short amount of time, because certainly this storm points to something. Look at these headlines. The Wall Street Journal says, the golden domed Al-Aqsa Mosque sits in the heart of Jerusalem's walled city on one of the most fought over spaces of land in the world. The mosque is located on the site known as the Noble Sanctuary to Muslims and the Temple Mount to Jews. Listen to this part right here. Hamas on Saturday blamed unspecified quote unquote desecration of the mosque after it launched its assault, which a Hamas official said was called Operation al Aska Storm. You see that? The next headline shares the Iranian support and points to both the mosque and Palestinians. Top Iranian commander says al Aska Mosque to be liberated soon. Iranian officials are openly encouraging Palestinians to escalate their efforts, liberating the al Aska Mosque from what he referred to as, quote unquote, the Zionist enemy. We see the leader of Iran posting this on X and even a celebration in Tehran celebrating what? The al Aska storm. I'm showing you all of this for a reason so you can better understand what's getting ready to happen biblically. World reacts to al Aqsa storm operation. Hamas commander says attacks are in defense of al Aqsa, claims 5,000 missiles fired at the time. It's known the world over that the Temple Mount has been a hot issue. The Muslims have a mosque there and the Jews want that third temple right where they believe the previous two were, right there on that mount. I want to draw your attention to this part of this article. The Temple Mount site is considered the holiest place in Judaism as the location of two biblical temples, while the Al-Aqsa Mosque is the third holiest shrine in Islam, making the area a major flashpoint in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Major conflicts and bouts of violence have broken out following events at the site, where Jews and other non-Muslims are permitted to visit during certain hours but may not pray under the status quo arrangement that has prevailed for decades. In recent years, Jewish religious nationalists, including members of the governing coalition, have increasingly visited the site and demanded equal prayer rights for Jews there, infuriating the Palestinians and Muslims around the world. Under the status quo arrangement, Jews and Christians can go up to the Temple Mount at certain times, but are not allowed to pray there. This is why we see the Jews at the wall like during Sukkot. There's over 50,000 Jews there in this shot. But around 1,415 Jews ascended the mount and they were escorted by police. Are you watching this? Is this a violation of the status quo? Now let me know in the comments. I'm trying to figure this out just like you. Is it the timing? They're not praying except this one guy. I'm not sure what he's doing. Here we see the waving of the four species. It's a mitzvah prescribed by their Torah. You can see the police officer responding to it. Now, the point here is that the Jews desire to be on that mount too. They want to be free to worship and pray on the Temple Mount. The significance to us Christians is totally different, right? 
the Jews have been wanting equal prayer rights on the Mount for a long time. I just want to remind everyone that this very thing was in the peace deal. If one can pray at the mosque, then they should be able to pray on the Mount. And here's the quote, Jerusalem's holy sites should remain open and available for peaceful worshipers and tourists of all faiths. People of every faith should be permitted to pray on the Temple Mount, Haram al-Sharif, in a manner that is fully respectful to their religion, taking into account the times of each religion's prayers and holidays, as well as other religious factors. Now check out that video on the screen for the deep dive into that. Now, in this particular article entitled, Gaza's Al-Aqsa Storm, Operation Means to Defend Holy Mosque, we see the claim by the leader of Hamas is that Operation Al-Aqsa Storm is a response to the desecration of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Perhaps this footage captured one of the incidents. arrived at the gates, they didn't let us in. They said only people 40 years and older can enter. They began to throw stone grenades while we were standing, not doing anything. We came only to pray in Al-Aqsa Mosque. We are coming from far away. It's a shame. This is our Al-Aqsa. We need to pray in it. They are forbidding us from entering. What do we do? is partially blaming, quote, increasing incitement on social media networks by terrorist organizations. But we have to remember that the Palestinians, their lives continue to deteriorate under the more than 50 year Israeli occupation. This year is on track to be another violent one in the occupied West Bank. 93 people. We don't know all of the details, but it's cited here that the prayer mats were stepped on. For a Muslim, certainly a big deal. Could this have been handled differently? Nope, I don't agree with Islam and we as Christians do not worship the same God. But again, could this have been handled differently? Another claim cited within this article was that the women at the mosque were attacked. Here's a clip of an incident. See, we don't know the details of this either. Could this have been handled better? I ask this tough question because this is how the accusations of human rights violations against Israel gains a foothold, depending on the point of view. Certainly there's more to this that we can cover, but this is a part of what leads to the escalation that we see within scripture. It also embodies the tension of these conflicts that build upon the scenario that we see that prompts the growing collective need for the third temple and the deep desire for the Jews to pray on the Temple Mount. 
And what leads to that? None other than Daniel 9, 27. In this part of the 70 weeks prophecy, we see that the sacrifices and oblations are resumed. This points to a third temple standing and a confirming of a covenant with many that begins the 70th week. And that runs alongside the tribulation. Note the proposal of the two-state solution. American interest in the Middle East used to be about having a supply of, of, uh, of, of fuel, right? Now, the American interest there is purely to stop radicalization. And the biggest element today that caused radicalization is the conflict with the Palestinians and the conflict with the mosque. And so if we can get some resolution on this issue, and what we've done today is a major step, right? Because we've given them an offer where for the first time, the, 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 the whole entire Islamic world can say, the mosque is safe, and any Muslim who wants to come to pray is welcome, right? We've also been in a place where we said, if the Palestinians want a state and they want uh, to thrive, they now have an offer on the table. The Palestinian people have grown distrustful after years of unfulfilled promises. So true. Yet I know they are ready to escape their tragic past and realize a great destiny. But we must break free of yesterday's failed approaches. This map will more than double the Palestinian territory and provide a Palestinian capital in eastern Jerusalem, where America will proudly open an embassy. No Palestinians or Israelis will be uprooted from their homes. Israel will work closely with a wonderful person, a wonderful man, the King of Jordan, to ensure that the status quo of the Temple Mount is preserved and strong measures are taken to ensure that all Muslims who wish to visit peacefully and pray at the al Aqwa Mosque will be able to do so. This is a major statement. This is of major import importance. And at the same time, our vision will deliver a massive commercial investment of $50 billion into the new Palestinian state. You have many, many countries that want to partake in this, and uh, many of them are surrounding. They all want this to happen. Virtually every one of them want this to happen, and I think, Bibi, you know that very well. You're going to have tremendous support from your neighbors and beyond your neighbors. Perhaps most importantly, my vision gives the Palestinians the time needed to rise up and meet the challenges of statehood. I sent a letter today to President Abbas. I explained to him that the territory allocated for his new state will remain open and undeveloped for a period of four years. During this time, Palestinians can use all appropriate deliberation to study the deal, negotiate with Israel, achieve the criteria for statehood, and become a truly independent and wonderful state. President Abbas, I want you to know that if you choose the path to peace, America and many other countries, will we, we will be there. We will be there to help you in so many different ways. And we will be there every step of the way. We will be there to help. It is here that we gain a bit of insight from Scripture as to how Jacob gets into trouble. Let's go to the book of Joshua, chapter 13, and let's pick it up at verse 1. Now, Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remains yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remains, all the borders of the Philistines and all Geshuri. God gave the land to Israel, right? It's theirs to possess. Now let's take a look at how the word Philistines connect to the Palestinians. In this text, the Strong's Concordance word for Philistines is H6430, translated from the Hebrew. Strong's definition says partial from Strong's definition H6429. We're going to get into that. It says a Pelishtite or inhabitant of Pelisheth, Philistine. And here's that root word etymology, 
partial from H6429. The Strong's definition says Pelasheth from H6428 means rolling, i.e. migratory. Pelasheth, a region of Syria, and here it is, Palestina, Palestine, Philistia, Philistines. Do you see that? The BDB lexicon says Philistia equals quote unquote land of sojourners. Further on, we see the general territory on the west coast of Canaan or the entire country of Palestine. Are you seeing this? So we see the Palestinian people represented here within scripture. Folks forget that God is involved. He gave Israel the land as an inheritance, and God told Israel that he will drive them out from before thee. Here's the boundaries. Exodus chapter 23, verses 30 through 33. By little and little, I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. And I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea, even unto the Sea of the Philistines. And we know by now the definition includes the Palestinians. And from the desert unto the river, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand. And you shall drive them out before thee. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto you. See that warning in verse 32? You shall make no covenant with them. Daniel 9, 27. They're going to make a covenant with many. This involves Israel and the city of Jerusalem. Watch how the many will include the Palestinians. And we already saw the dividing of the city of Jerusalem within that peace plan. Jacob's going to get into trouble with God. Israel didn't drive them out when they were supposed to. As time passed, they sinned against God and were scattered around the world. We know the story. And when God gathered them back into the land, guess who was there? Unfinished business the Palestinians. But now the snare is in full effect. Israel can't drive them out like they want to. Hence, this piece of the Operation al Aska storm involves the known tension involving the mosque, and that leads to the aforementioned recorded within biblical prophecy. Keep that in mind while we watch this unfold. Also keep in mind something that is very hard for some to grasp, and it is hard to hear. God has a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When Isaac and Ishmael came along, the everlasting covenant with God was with Isaac, not Ishmael. Genesis chapter 17. Let's pick this up at verse 19. And God said, Sarah, your wife, shall bear thee a son indeed and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation." See, the land of Israel, in part, is a covenant with God. Genesis chapter 50, verse 24, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Exodus chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Are you seeing this? 
And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. What did God say to Moses from the burning bush? Exodus chapter 3 and 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. The world tries to focus on the commonality of Abraham, especially with things like the Abraham Accords. But the covenant with God is only within a specific line. This is so God's word can be fulfilled, that the word became flesh to dwell among us. The covenant with God is specific and is used in part to reveal God to the world through his son, Jesus Christ. And this points to what Jesus did for all of us worldwide upon that cross. As we look at what's going on in Israel, if we take God out of it, we're going to miss the whole point of it all and where it points to. Pray for the innocent lives involved on both sides. There's way more to this than we're getting from news sources, and the Bible has the details. That's it for now. Just wanted to share this. All right, till we meet again, live holy before the Lord. Love y'all. Shalom. Thank you.